Thank you so much, uh, Marisa, for the warm introduction. And welcome everyone to this session, bright and early. Um, it is for me at least. <laughs> Our power went out last night, so I uh, had to sleep a little bit later than usual. Um, so welcome. Let's see. So this session is called Culturally Responsive Practices, or CRP for short. Uh, you'll be hearing us refer to the acronym CRP um, since culturally responsive practices is kind of a little bit of a mouthful. Um, in ABE specifically, um, you might have heard this being used a lot, especially in K-12, but I think it's a little bit newer um, in terms of um, being talked about in, in the field of ABE. So I'm very excited to be here. Uh, so this is a two-part presentation. Um, I will be leading facilitating the first part and um, Aaron Carey will be uh, facilitating presenting the second part. So the first part is really focused on philosophies and the foundation and we might even go over a little bit of the history of CRP. Um, the second part will be going over the curriculum um, that Aaron had uh, created the, the template that you can use um, as a practical um, strategy and tool in your classrooms. So stay tuned for that. That's right after the session. That's me. <laughs> uh, I'm the Learning Center's co-manager at Literacy Minnesota. I go by she, her, hers pronoun. Um, you know, instead of talk about my professional background um, and experiences doing cultural outreach or working with um, different cultural groups, um, I wanted to make it a little bit more personal and, and let you know that this topic is very um, important and close to me, uh, particularly as someone who grew up as the only person of color in my uh, elementary classroom um, and always feeling somewhat alienated um, because teachers and other classmates and parents didn't really understand um, necessarily the cultural context that I came from um, and a lot of assumptions were made and um, I, I felt a lot of times uh, the odd one out, the odd child out and very different. And so this really kind of prompted me to embark on a path where um, I am working actively to try to um, help students feel uh, affirmed and validated in their classrooms, no matter their background. All right, some key takeaways. So expand understanding of culture and its teaching and learning. Oh, and I also want to state this as well, um, some housekeeping. If you do chat out in the, in the chat box, um, I might miss it. Uh, so my colleague Erin will bring it to my attention if there's time. Um, so I know this is a very short session, 45 minutes. And so we won't be able to cover the huge scope of what this uh, topic actually uh, entails, but we'll kind of gloss over a lot of different terminologies. All right, and understand the mindset that promotes culturally responsive practices in the classroom and consider the benefits of structuring ABE classrooms around learning partnership alliances. So like, let's just dive in. All right, and yes, stay tuned. Uh, this could be a short break after this session and we're gonna jump right into Aaron's um, session. So very basic question, but I'm curious. What does culture mean to you? Chat it out in the box. What is culture? No wrong answers. Assumptions and implicit understandings, most of it is invisible. 
Thank you. How I naturally, let's see, people's way of life, norms, traditions, uh, how we naturally interact with the world around us, customs, traditions, food in caps, yes, food, a way of viewing the world based on where and how you are raised, food and languages, again, values, tradition, heritage, lifestyles, choices, norms and practices um, that are in your family, yes. Patterns and thinking of doing, patterns of thinking and uh, doing life, the way I talk. Thank you, Maya. Uh, Marilyn, set of common beliefs and values, collective behaviors, norms, lifestyle of a group, set of social beliefs, behaviors, art, language, shared values, Traditions and customs, traditions, expectations, family, religion, geography based, expected, our common values, politics, cultures, a variety of facets that make up who you are and impacts everything one does. Everything we are and do, traditions, holidays. Uh, deaf culture is not geography based, but it's alive and well. Thank you so much for bringing that up, Erin. Uh, tradition, habits, norms, customs, written, unwritten rules, so implicit rules, explicit, uh, how it guides and direct us to interact with one another, community, social groups, great. Looks like there's a ton of other answers coming in. Thank you so much for your participation. Yes, these are all great, are all great answers. So you can spend multiple PhDs um, diving into one aspect of culture. Um, but I'm just gonna give you a very brief basic definition so that we have a uh, same working definition moving forward. So definition of culture uh, based on Merriam-Webster's online dictionary, customary beliefs, social, social for, forms, I'm sorry, that should be norms, it's a typo, and material traits of a racial, religious, or social group. So culture is central to learning. This is why we're talking about this today. Um, it plays a key role in communicating and receiving information and in shaping the thinking process of groups and individuals. Um, I'll give you an example. So when I worked in an Afrocentric school, so this was a school that was a charter school in St. Paul that uh, no longer exists, unfortunately, but all of the teachers were black, um, the administrators were black, the board were black. Uh, the students, predominantly 98% of them and their families identified as Black or African American. And um, they, they were cultural norms that were very uh, different um, than what I was used to, um, having grown up in a very different environment um, and went to school in a very different environment. Um, there was a lot of call and response used in the classroom. And so for those of you who might not be aware of what call and response is, it's basically rooted in um, African traditions of spiritual and tribal, uh, sacred tribal rituals and traditions um, that are very melodic and rhythmic um, that require um, rapid verbal exchange between the orator and the public. Um, and so you might see this in a church, African-American church, or you might see this in um, you know, any type of community setting, um, maybe some schools as well. So one that was used frequently was Ago and Ame. Um, so Ago, if from the Twi Western African language, uh, means um, who's listening. And I believe, uh, uh, May means I'm here. Um, and so this was often used to get the attention of the pupils by the teacher. Um, and it was very melodic, it was very rhythmic, um, but it was really based in this kind of cultural tradition that I was not privy to, but um, I thought that was very interesting as well. Um, when I taught uh, Upward Bound, there was a teacher who, his whole thesis was around pedagogy of uh, hip hop or hip hop pedagogy. And so he used hip hop in the classroom to engage students, especially um, what you would call quote unquote urban students 
Um, so many of the students were either Puerto Rican, um, Afro-Caribbean, Black, American. And he would use in the composition class this, um, this, this technique called, um, well, he would use cipher, rap cipher. So basically, pu this pupils would sit in a circle. They would be facing each other, and they would be um, rapping um, either to they'd either recall lyrics that they were familiar with or completely freestyle. And they would incorporate things that they learned in class. They would incorporate things that they interpreted from their own life. And it was a way for them to exchange ideas and be critical of the environment around them. So there was a lot of this uh, critical literacy component as well as um, just being able to interpret new information and this was really awesome because I had never heard of this, like Cypher Rap, Rap Cypher. Like it was really interesting and they were so good at it too. Um, and so familiar. Um, so when it came to my turn, I was like, uh, uh, I don't know this because I'm used to just facing a teacher at a whiteboard and having them speak at me and raising my hand if I knew an answer. Um, but he was engaging them in a way that was culturally responsive. Um, Great. Culture is not fluid and it's, uh, it's fluid and it's not fixed. So think of it not as something that's in a continuum, something that you can achieve. So you hear this term cultural competency. Um, and I always wonder how can you be co competent in someone else's culture, especially if it's a moving target, if it's always changing and adapting to the environment around um, how can you become an expert in someone else's culture. Um, and so I just thought that was really, that's, that's a very um, misleading term. And I think it's a time to put that at rest. I'm much more um, interested in using the term cultural humility, which I think is a, is a good term to use our cultural responsiveness or cultural attunement. Anyway, so here's a model. Um, this is in the Zretta Hammond's book, uh, Culturally Responsive Practices in the Brain. I recommend looking into this. We will have a resource list at the end uh, that uh, Aaron will provide you. And these slides are also available as well. This tree model is in that book. Um, it's similar to the iceberg model of uh, culture, if you've ever seen it, uh, where there is shallow culture. Um, there's deep culture and there's surface culture. So surface culture, these are the, the heroes and the holidays. You know, what do we learn in school? The cultural festivals, um, the, the clothing, the food, the dress, um, language. Um, this has low emotional impact. Um, but then there's the shallow culture. These are unspoken rules. Uh, this has more of a high emotional impact on uh, trust and by emotional impact, what we mean is if there's kind of this infringement or if someone doesn't feel like they're being respected um, in this regard, then this has they, there's reactivity usually to it um, feelings of anger, feelings of hurt, uh, feelings of being rejected, perhaps. Um, so, within this category, this middle trunk category. This is conceptions of time, um, eye contact, ways of handling emotion. Um, so like I identify as Asian American, can't speak for other Asian Americans, but I know that in my family and my circle, um, emotions were not necessarily verbalized. A lot of times um, parents, uh, guardians, siblings, relatives didn't necessarily say, I love you explicitly. Um, and I know this is common with many other Asians as well. Um, and, and love is shown in different ways, maybe through food, um, lots of food. <laughs> uh, again, I don't want to stereotype, but this was my experience. Um, Nonverbal communication, child rearing practices, deep culture. So this has really kind of collective and unconscious this is collective and unconscious. This is really kind of more intense in terms of the emotional impact. Um, you see that there's a lot of political division in this country. And it's, um, I believe, really based in 
this deep culture, this root, um, and this, this division between ideology. Um, we were talking about ideologies here. Um, so these are worldviews. Um, what are some examples that you can think of of, of deep culture? Um, so this is concept of a higher power, spirituality, cosmology, how the world began. Um, what are some examples? You can chat it out. Individualism versus collectivism. Um, yeah, I think that would actually. That's a really good um, point. Ethics, customs, views of understanding health and illness. Freedom, I think that's a huge one. Like uh, what is considered freedom? Um, that's, that's for sure. I have uh, old classmates and friends who are currently stuck in Kabul. Um, and we've all seen the fall of Afghanistan to the Taliban in the last few days. And so that's um, a division in, in terms of ideology, um, you know, democracy versus a theocracy, I would say. Um, and so, yeah, there's, there's a lot of this. Individualism versus collectivism. Yes, that's a really good one. Uh, we're not going to talk about this too much um, or at all, but there is this index, uh, this cultural theorist that I would recommend everyone look into it called Hofstede. I forgot the first name, but Hofstede Index. And so this is an index of uh, different nations and how they rank in terms of their collectivism versus the individualism. Um, and so uh, who do you think really ranks really high in individualism? like in terms of a nation state. So the US maybe, Canada, yes, Hofstede, I, I believe it's this Hofstede index. US and Australia, yes, they're very high. Great, thank you, Marissa. Um, and so who's really low in the index, like in terms of um, being very high in terms of collectivist uh, values. So this is, uh, these are values where people are uh, thinking of community, they're thinking of um, less of individual merits and successes, and uh, thinking of their actions as tied to um, the goal of improving society or improving uh, the collective good, maybe a family or um, kinship circle or tribal affiliation. So in terms of high and collect collectivistic values, um, that's a lot of Latin American countries, African na nations as well. I think Guatemala ranked really high in terms of collectivists. All right, let's move on. So culturally responsive practices. So it's helpful to think of this as a mindset um, around organizing instruction to allow for flexibility in teaching. Um, there's not one set strategy uh, where we'll make you an expert in culturally responsive practices because like we said, culture is not fixed, it's fluid um, and it changes within the context it changes individual to individual um, in terms of your relationship. And so that's really key to understanding how to um, approach CRP. It's uh, not so much a set of rules that you have to um, follow in order to be a good or competent in, in delivering this type of curriculum. So basically it's a pedagogy that acknowledges and celebrates culture. Uh, offers full equitable access to education for students uh, from all cultures. And so what it really isn't is prescriptive, prescriptive strategies are a bag of tricks. And I think this is really important because um, a lot of us, and some of the feedback I actually got from the last time I presented on this was, 
I I don't really care about the philosophy or the foundations or the values behind CRP. Give me some strategies to bring into the classroom. And I think, okay, I understand and that's valid because you want to um, be able to deliver something that's uh, good for your students. I get that. But a lot of this theory and this philosophy is based on uh, reflecting on your own self, uh, your own biases, your own um, prejudices, and reflecting on your, perhaps your, um, your privileges as well, and how that impacts the relationship that you might have with your learners. Does that make sense? Does someone, does anyone have any questions about this slide? Yes, CRP is for us as well as our learners. Thank you, yes. So what are some tenets of CRP? So as I said, really, really crucial to examine your implicit bias. So these are unconscious prejudices that you might have towards um, group groups outside of your own. Um, you can take the Harvard implicit bias test. Um, there's a number of them. There's, um, there's one for uh, bias against Native Americans, uh, Black people, people with disabilities, Asians, um, the list goes on and on. Um, sexism, um, I think it's very interesting when I took it, um, it was really telling to the number of prejudices that I held um, unconsciously, you know, I, I think of myself as a progressive person who's uh, very open and accepting of others, but uh, just the way that we're socialized in a pretty white supremacist society, a, a patriarchal society, a capitalistic society, we get indoctrinated um, with certain sets of values, um, whether that's from our family of origin or from our church or from our um, primary school teachers, uh, the media, we're bombarded with these types of messages that uh, become very deeply seated in our psyche. And so to really um, detangle that and, and to, really, um, to really look at that and examine that, it's, it sometimes brings up a lot of pain, um, which I think is, is part, is, a huge part of this work actually is it's self-reflection, uh, which is maybe why people want to focus on strategy because it's less it's less painful, it's less scary to 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 not have to look at yourself and examine your own set of prejudices. Um, so, asset-based versus deficit mindset. Um, think of your students coming in with assets versus needing to fix them. Um, so I think of this particularly like with African-American English, um, maybe you've heard of African-American vernacular English or AVE. Um, it's seen in society as lower English um, or not correct English. Um, there's stereotypes about the types of people who use AVE and really linguists have been studying this and they, they've, found that African-American English has its own set of predictable rules and complex grammar structures that um, are range from geographies and um, are very unique to this culture um, that stems even from Africa, like the origin, um, we talked about call and response. And so in Oakland, the school board had actually ruled in 1996 that African-American English, or back then it was called Ebonics, was um, ruled as valid form of English and legitimate form of English and not to be corrected in school um, and seen as an asset and that those students were uh, bi-dialectical. Um, and so I thought that's a really, really cool way of portraying students instead of saying, you need to be fixed, instead of saying um, a sentence like that, um, that's incorrect, you need to speak in a standard English way. Um, so, which is really based on middle-class uh, 
like white values and in English grammatical structure. So high expectations. Think of your students as um, achievers, people who can achieve goals, um, understanding what their goals are instead of saying, hey, this is the bar <laughs> and the bar is low and I want, and because that is my, um, my bias, right, of, of what you can achieve. And I've, I've seen this before. Um, and I've seen this with, especially um, in some classrooms uh, with some volunteers who work with lower level students who may have had gaps in their schooling. Um, they might present um, maybe perhaps a learning disability. Um, and so there's this uh, lower expectation, which doesn't necessarily it doesn't, it's not really necessarily a help, lead to like a healthy relationship between pupil and student uh, because there's an unequal power dynamic. Um, let's see, oh, lots of comments. Okay, so Aaron left the implicit bias test. And I think these links can be uh, sent out afterwards as well, I believe. Um, let's see. What is the difference between other CRP culturally re relevant pedagogy? I'm not really sure what you mean by that, Krista. Um, issue, if I could jump in, this is Erin. I think yeah. they're very similar. It might just be models that are, you know, being um, uh, studied or talked about by different practitioners or um, theorists, but I think they both do focus on recognizing the culture that students bring into the classroom and focusing on students' abilities rather than deficits and not viewing them in a deficient way. It might just be a slightly different terminology. I could be wrong. Maybe there are tweaks that are different. Yeah, definitely. There's a lot of uh, cultural theorists and um, people in multicultural ed um, who do work on culturally responsive pedagogies, um, culturally relevant pedagogies, um, and they all build on each other, right? It, you know, in academics, people kind of build on different theories. Um, and so Erin will be going through some of the origin of that um, through Paulo Freire. Um, Freire, Freire and Thad is it's kind of very much. Um, part of the origin of where this all stems from. So yeah, good question. Right. Um, so Marilyn, like you mentioned early on, humility as a teacher is a key element in learning to be culturally sensitive. As a teacher, our focus should be on how we can help our students be the best that they can be. Thank you. Uh, Andrea, according to linguists, there's no one type or dialect of English that is superior to others. Which types of speaking have the most prestigious based solely on which culture is perceived to have the most power? And yeah, that's a really good point. We, you know, when we think about the tenets of culture, it's also important to examine uh, power structures and dynamics in society. Um, the same reason why there is uh, reverse racism doesn't exist or reverse sexism doesn't exist, uh, it's because of. Um, unequal power dynamics um, based in systems that were um, put up um, through colonialism, through the suppression of women, um, the exclusion of uh, indigenous groups. Um, and so I think that's really important to look at when we're examining our implicit bias. What kind of privileges do you come into the room with? Um, in what ways? Um, do you have identities that might marginalize you? Are, are you part of the LGBTQ community? Um, you know, are you mixed race? Uh, do you belong to a religious group that is uh, minoritized or a minority? Great. So just very quickly, uh, contextualized learning. Again, make it uh, make learning relatable to students. Um, what what kind of context are they coming from? Um, so you can do this in math. You can do this with a English uh, curriculum as well. 
uh, use images that uh, are not foreign to them. So if you're using images of only white middle-class uh, heteronormative families, um, that might be off-putting to some people because that doesn't relate to them necessarily. Um, it's good to see a diverse, diversity of images. Um, however, if they're only always seeing one type of image, um, the implicit message or the hidden curriculum behind that is that this is the group. These are the types of people who are valued in society and people who might look like you are not. Um, and this is kind of how I felt growing up. I did not see myself reflect in the history books. I did not see myself in my English composition class, um, so on and so forth. Share power in the classroom. Um, who's talking the most? I know I'm talking at you right now. Like I'm talking a lot. We have 45 minutes. You know, if I really had a, a whole day to do this, I'd want to make this a lot more modeling of what uh, culturally responsive practice really is, is which is power sharing, understanding that everyone in the room has assets and knowledge. Erin's um, gonna go over funds and knowledge. We come with um, sets of values that are assets. You know, use those assets in the classroom so that people can learn from each other. It's relationship focused. So this is really the crux of all of this. It's what is your relationship with your pupils? Uh, what is your uh, pupils, I say pupils, your learners. Uh, what is your learners relationship to you, to volunteers, to each other? And that is so important, um, especially when you're trying to build um, for a more dynamic learning environment. You hear a lot about social emotional learning, that terminology being thrown around, especially in K-12, but I think it's really important to think about the emotional aspect of the classroom space. Do students feel affirmed and heard and validated? Um, because if you're not, especially if you've experienced um, sustained trauma in your life, maybe complex PTSD, um, and you're hyper vigilant, you know that's not conducive to learning because you're consistently in this fight, uh, fight, flee, or freeze mode, um, and you're unable to really free up that mental space to to be creative, to do problem solving, to do more complex high order thinking, because you're operating more in this kind of reptilian um, part of your brain. Andrea knows a lot about that. Go to her uh, uh, trauma session if you haven't yet, um, not in this conference, but at Literacy Minnesota. So the elephant in the room is always this, but we never talk about it. And so I'm gonna talk about it today. <laughs> uh, white saviorism. The white savior complex is defined as um, a term in which a white person or more broadly a white culture rescues people of color from their own situation. Um, so this is an image of uh, Victor Gillum's uh, The White Man Burden. This was also a poem by Bridget Kipling, A White Man's Burden, basically that was this terminology was created during uh, the age of basically imperialism, European imperialism throughout the world, <laughs> uh, throughout Africa, Asia, um, the Americas, um, Caribbeans, everywhere basically. And this idea that um, the white person embodies goodness, uh, enlightenment, um, the right values, the right features, um, the right religion, and that needs to be spread throughout um, the barbarian people. And uh, a more modern version of this is uh, maybe missionary work. Uh, I was in Peace Corps, Peace Corps. <laughs> this, this, um, this sense of like, we're here to save people. We're here to spread American culture, or white American culture more specifically, white American values. Um, that I speak English, and everyone, and because I speak English, I'm qualified to teach this classroom. Um, you know, and so there's this idea that um, other people need to be saved from their own values. So consider and reflect. Uh, we have a few minutes left, but uh, I think this is important. 
Culturally responsive pedagogy requires educators to examine their own biases. What made you gravitate towards literacy or education? And is it embedded in white saviorism? You don't have to say it out loud, <laughs> but just reflect in your mind. Um, and how does culturally responsive practices push back against white saviorism? And what can you do to counter white saviorism in your classroom or work? Um, so take 30 seconds to reflect on the, this question, uh, the red one, the one um, bolded in red and type it out. And um, maybe we have a brave volunteer who wants to share their thoughts as well. And you're welcome to. And by the way, uh, this is this image is from Barbie Savior. Uh, Instagram handle Barbie Savior. It's pretty hilarious. Um, it's basically Barbie going around African countries, I believe, um, and posing posing like these Instagram pictures um, with um, black and brown children. Yes, uh, thank you, Krista. And an ECFE child, uh, a child care worker said, don't they or immigrants come here to be like us? Yeah, basically I've, I've heard this a lot too. It's, it's too bad, you know, especially in ECFE, that's like developmentally some of the most important time in a human's development is, is early childhood. All right. All right, Erin. So I think I had a talent for language and English literacy related academia, plus some language teaching experience, not English, at the beginning of my career that attracted me to the profession, not particularly learner focus. I am still unlearning that ego driven mindset. Yeah, thank you so much for that um, reflection, Erin, and that vulnerability. I appreciate that. Liz, I think living abroad really helped me with the, that savior mindset. It's very humbling when you go to another country and need help with everything. It's true. What about students who idealize white and white culture? So yeah, I mean, we don't have too much time to unpack that, but when, especially with, um, the way that colonialism um, has is so pervasive um, in our society and in all societies really um, had really stripped away um, many cultures in, in terms of, uh, and not only just like cultural um, beliefs and um, activities um, and religion even in languages, but also of people's um, like confidence in themselves, their belief that their culture is something that is good and should be practiced. And they start internalizing or in, internalizing their own inferiority to the colonizer. Um, I recommend reading Franz Fanon, um, The Wretched of the Earth, um, anything by Franz Fanon really talks about that, this kind of psychology, this mentality of self-hate that gets drilled into the colonized. And I would say most of us are, are part of that group. Um, you know, I, it took me a long time to be okay with myself and the way that I looked in my family, in my, um, my family of origin and my own beliefs because I've internalized the inferiority uh, of my own group, um, that message, so. Looks like we have just about five minutes, four to five minutes mm -hmm. left, Ichu. Mm -hmm. All right, we're gonna move on. So yeah, I'm not gonna go over this too much, but um, this is another theorist, uh, Gloria Latin billing uh, believes that there's three pillars to cultural responsive practices, academic rigor, cultural competency or humility or social political consciousness. And um, I really wanna uh, draw attention to this social political consciousness 
Uh, we haven't talked about this a lot, but when we're drawn to this type of pedagogy, it makes us more critically aware of the conditions in which we live. And sometimes that's um, in marginalized conditions. And so the origins of this, of Freire's work was to uplift the, the oppressed. And Anne will talk about this more, um, you know, in the pedagogy of the oppressed, how literacy and education is a tool for freedom and for, for critical thought um, and to fight back against oppression. And so, yeah, uh, if you want any examples of this, like I can give you some from history, think about the Zapatistas in uh, San Cristobal um, in Chiapas in Mexico, um, how they fought back against uh, the multinational corporations. You think about peasant movements, unions, um, there's just so many examples in history. So why is this important? To honor a learner's identity, to promote equity and inclusion in the classroom, to increase engagement as well. Uh, we talked about how we can increase engagement by using the cultural context in which learners come from um, and to support critical thinking and independent thinking. I'm sorry, there's just so many comments. I wish this session was a little bit longer so we can go a little bit over. Um, this is um, really important as well. I just wanna go quickly over this slide um, before we uh, transition to part two. So building learning partnerships, this is really important. Um, after you've done this reflection and you really think about uh, where your learners are coming from, who they are, um, Think about ways that you can increase uh, affirmation and validation in the classroom. And so when you can calm people's nervous system, when you can make them feel safe in a classroom is when you can really facilitate learning. Um, I'm sure a lot of you uh, are aware of this, you know, in K-12, it looks a little different. I've worked in K-12, um, they require to be there. So you'll see everything, you'll see fighting, you'll see um, students who are checked out. Uh, you'll see a lot of things, but uh, typically in the adult classroom, you might see absenteeism, you might see students becoming very defensive or shut down. Um, and so sometimes that could be a trauma response as well. So how do you calm the nervous system? Uh, create affirming and validating environments. Um, make your students feel seen and heard. Um, uplift their achievements without relying on stereotypes. Um, and the learning centers, we always have tea and coffee for learners as well as water available. Uh, there's prayer rugs. Many of our students are East African or Muslim um, and they require prayer breaks. Um, and so typically there's a room with prayer rugs that they can go to to pray, uh, build a, pedagogy of uh, build trust through pedagogy of listening. Um, a lot of us think that we listen, but we only just kind of hear people and we are really focused a lot of times on responding. Um, but uh, there's this whole pedagogy around listening. What does it mean to be actively listening to someone? And that's not just listening through two words, but listening to body language. Um, what, is your what is your student telling you? Um, what are their needs? Uh, really ask them a lot of questions before jumping to assumptions or conclusions or judgments. So like, just think about like when you're in a fight with like a spouse or a family member, a best friend, how painful it is to not feel heard or validated. Um, you shut down, you might become defensive. There's different types of defense mechanisms that you rely on. And a lot of times this stems from your response mechanism from, from early childhood um, in coping with a situation that's not ideal. And so you might see this in the classroom as well. Become warm demander. Um, like again, expect a lot from your students, but meet them from where they are. Like ask them what their goals are, ask them what their dreams are. Um, ask them what they feel capable of and, and push them as well. Um, 
But when you, and I've seen this as well, like in the classroom, especially with students who have, feel like they're rejected in society or that they're not seen as smart. Um, a lot of times they're marginalized in the classroom. Um, I remember I worked with a group of African-American boys, uh, fifth graders, who were seen as the troublemakers or the high flyers, the ones who got into fights a lot. They were my favorite students. Um, <laughs> I, I love challenges, but they were just such amazing human beings, really. And I expected a lot from them. And I brought in a coach and a mentor who came from their community, who was older, who they could look up to. And he was tough on them. And he demanded a lot and they respected and they loved him at the end. Um, and I think that's important to keep in mind that um, you're not necessarily here to um, just, you know, expect the, the least from your students um, because you want to be seen as nice. Um, I think what people really need is to be heard and to be affirmed and that you're listening and wanting the best for them. So, all right, I know I went over a, a little bit. <laughs> um, these are some, I'm gonna leave you with some questions to ponder about. If you want to share um, maybe a couple thoughts as well in the chat, um, please feel free to. Oh, I'm sorry, there's so many comments. I can't get to all of these. Um, but I'm hoping that people have been reading them along the way. So yeah, these are all questions that I would love for you all to reflect on. And if you see some colleagues here in the presentation, um, please feel free to connect with them to reflect more on ways that you can move forward with this. And Erin uh, will be giving you some pretty concrete tools on how you can take what you've just heard and learned um, in a practical way in your classrooms. So thank you so much.